Okay, I can see people are slowly joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, so let me just start a very brief introduction so that everybody can join while we're, while we're taking you through um, the more practical stuff like the housekeeping rules. So welcome to the SESDA Data Management Expert Guide webinar on why and how to use it. Uh, here we've listed all our speakers of today and all the people that have supported in uh, bringing this uh, webinar to, uh, to, uh, to a reality. Um, my name is Marik Willems. Uh, I'm a research communication and stakeholder engagement specialist at Trust IT. And together with my colleague, Stephanie Parker, senior research analyst, we've supported, we've been supporting SESDA in the promotion of the data management expert guide, uh, this exact topic of this webinar. So first we have a few housekeeping rules. Uh, you've entered the webinar in a listen only mode. Uh, so you can type in your questions in the Q&A option that you have at the lower level of this, uh, of the platform. And uh, after the first half of the webinar, uh, where our speakers will give three sh very short presentations, uh, we invite you to ask our speakers almost anything. Uh, and we can then unmute you to ask your question in person. We will keep a close eye on the question and answer um, part of, uh, of the, the platform. So today's aim, um, today's aim is to discuss with a co-author, a trainer, and an early career researcher why and how to use the guide for research data management in the social sciences and beyond. So here you see uh, the, the image of the uh, CESDA webinar and a graphic overview of what its structure is. So today's agenda. So first we, we will uh, want to ask you a few questions, the CESDA DMAC quiz uh, and you. Uh, so then we follow we uh, follow up with the DMAC, the author's perspective, brought to you by Ricarda Brautmann from the Dance. Then DMAC, the trainer's uh, perspective uh, by T Patricia Miranda from ICS U Lisboa. And then DMAC, the user's perspective uh, by Sotirat Seang from Eurodoc. Uh, and then we, we dive into the discussion with all three of our speakers and you. So today's perspectives, uh, Ricarda Bragman here, you can see her uh, with a picture, but you can also see her here uh, already among our speakers. Uh, she's the co-author of the DMAC. Uh, then we have Patricia Miranda, RDM trainer, and we have Sotirat Seang, early career researcher. So welcome to you all, and thank you for joining uh, the webinar today. So now it's time for uh, a few minutes of a quiz. This is a DMAC quiz. Um, I would like to ask you to go and to Slido uh, and then uh, type in the hashtag G806. I'll stop sharing my screen for a second. So that I can take you there. So again, Slido and then hashtag G806. So this is where you can join the quiz. So slido.com and hashtag G06. Okay, so see people are joining. Good, so slido.com, hashtag G806. Okay, great. Many of you have found it. Okay, so let's have the first question. So which personal data is considered sensitive and is subject to specific processing conditions under GDPR? So you have a few seconds to answer the question. You have the answers in your own device. So which personal data is considered sensitive and is subject to specific processing conditions under GDPR? Okay, so let's see. So most of you have got this right. Uh, so, uh, a few of you uh, have also uh, said nationality. Let's see who is now on stage for winning this. Oh, sorry. 
that was a bit too quick. Why would researchers archive and publish their data? So you have the answers in your device. So why would researchers archive and publish their data? So there's more, more right answers to this question. Good. Nice. So Joe is taking here the, uh, the lead, followed by Britta, Jessica, AGD, and Irina. Well done. So where does a data management plan fit into my research project uh, workflow? So where does it fit? And which data repository should be your first choice? Very well. And then the last question, a DMP is a living document and can change over time. Okay, so we have the winner here, Lisa Salau, uh, Easy Life and Britta and Joe. So it's nice to see uh, that you already have uh, a lot of knowledge about the DMAC, but Ricarda, I think there's a lot more to the, to the DMAC than we've seen from these five very few questions. Um, so I would like to invite you to take us through it. Um, let me start sharing my screen again. Yes, thank you, Marika. I'll be briefly uh, presenting you. Oh, sorry, these are all our, uh, our infographics that you'll be receiving also in the post webinar mail that you will receive. So Ricarda, I'll briefly present you and then I'll, I'll invite you to, uh, to take the floor. So Dr. Ricarda works as program leader, social sciences at the Data Archiving and Network Services, DANS a national data center in the Netherlands. In this role, Ricardo coordinates the social sciences activities at DANS, in particular, the involvement in international infrastructures, including CESDA. Ricardo is involved in the development of research data management training, as well as outreach and communication activities, and has been one of the authors of the CESDA Data Management Expert Guide. Ricardo has, a, has an academic background in psychology and cognitive neuroscience, and received a PhD in social sciences, studying infants, at high fam familial risk for autism. Ricarda, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Marike, for inviting me for this webinar, but also for the very nice introduction. And it's uh, good to see that a lot of you uh, answered the questions in the quiz correctly. So you have, I assume, a bit of a knowledge about data management already, which is really nice. And today we want to talk a bit about the data management expert guide that we have been developing at CESTA. And indeed, as Marika said, so I'm, I was asked to give you an author's perspective. And I should say that this was really an effort of a lot of different um, institutes and people. And so I'm just uh, representing one of these people that has worked on it. So most of this actually has been done also by my colleague Ellen Lenat Zedans, who has been leading this work on the data management expert guides and by many, many others uh, from CESTA. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, what I wanted to tell you about is um, the, the basic questions on the data management expert guide and what it is. So what it is, uh, how you can use it, when it was developed, 
and um, just give you a big, bit of a background of why we made this guide um, and for whom it, uh, it can be useful. So if you could go to the next slide. So the, the data management expert guide or short, we call it the DMAC is a, is a guide on research data management or RDM. And it's primarily uh, designed for early career researchers uh, in the social sciences. So we wanted to have a place where um, researchers and particularly those who are uh, still learning about uh, project management and setting up their research, where those researchers can learn about research data management and all of the things that are involved with this. Because we know that um, research data management is very important to actually make sure that your data is um, well maintained and also that it can be reused and that it is made fair and a lot of uh, focus on proper research data management has been given in the past um, past years also by funders so we wanted to help um, researchers by providing them with information in on rdm in one central place and this um, this tour guide is uh, created by sesta and sesta is the consortium of european social science data archives um, and we have quite a lot of data archives that do research data management training already, but the materials that we had were very scattered. So there were materials in different places and we wanted to cre create one guide um, online accessible to everybody that can be used um, by researchers and where we could combine the knowledge that we had. So the first version of the data management expert guide was released in 2017 and we are still updating it uh, every year, creating new materials, new chapters and also updating the materials that we uh, um, that we have. So the, the data management expert guide is free to use at cesta.eu slash DMAC and it has a CC by SA license. So we really encourage people to use the materials and reuse the materials and um, use it as widely as possible um, to make sure the knowledge that we have there is, is shared amongst the community. And if you could go to the next slide. So this is, um, this is an, an extract from the um, process that was made to design this um, data management expert guide, where um, the group of people that was involved in this um, basically tried to uh, write down what this is as sort of a, a, a statement about the guide. And you can see that we wanted to design it for social scientists who are in the early stage of practicing research data management. And it should be um, an expert tour guide and that is open and that provides discipline specific and hands on guidance from a European perspective with local expertise. And we compared it to some other um, courses that are already online um, in contrast to which we wanted to have a more general uh, audience and we also wanted to have this international perspective. So what we really wanted with this guide is that, is it, that it is a relatively simple and short guide that provides basic understanding, but also a lot of um, information to get into, into more depth with particular topics. And we also wanted to make it uh, fun and nice, uh, nice to look at. And I think we, we have achieved that. So also the images that you see in this presentation are from the data management expert guide. And I think it has been, it's a really nice, nice guide to look at. Um, yes, and if you could go to the next slide. So what we do in the data management expert guide is we follow the research data life cycle. Um, those of you who are in research and probably also the data supporters amongst you might know this already. There are different, different versions of this, but the idea is that there are several stages in your research uh, where data management is important. So you start out with the, the, the planning of your research um, and all of these different aspects in the life cycle are different chapters in the data management expert guide. So we have this planning chapter and then an, a chapter on organizing and documenting data, a chapter on processing data, a chapter on data storage, uh, a chapter on protection of data, where we cover things like um, consent from participants or the GDPR, um, a chapter on publishing data, and a chapter on data discovery. And for all of these chapters, um, people can find information about research data management and the things that they can do in these chapters to, um, to um, help their, their research. If you could go to the next slide. So this is an example of what the, the guide looks like. So for instance, for the, for the store, 
uh, chapter, you can see on the left there is um, there there are the different subsections that we have in this chapter. So in this case, you can learn about storage, backup, and security. And there are also specific sections on data management planning in each of the chapters. And we also have some main takeaways um, that uh, tell people what they can learn in these different chapters. And alongside all of this information, we have these um, visualizations and images that make the, the guide, I think, a little bit nice to look at as well. And if you go to the next slide for me, um, I can show you some of the recurring elements that we have uh, put into the, the guide to make sure that all the information is presented in a coherent way and also so that people can learn about different, different aspects uh, related to data management. So, for instance, um, often the chapters cover expert tips that give information about um, specific uh, tips for, for research data management or specific issues or provide additional information for people to learn a little bit more and go into a little bit more detail. Uh, we have sections on European diversity, which is something that we really wanted because we noticed that there is, um, we, we were from SESTA from a lot of different art archives and there are a lot of different um, procedures and things that we do in different countries and research is, uh, is global. So we thought that it would be really interesting and nice for people to have a place where they can look at um, how, for instance, different policies related to data management are handled in different European countries. So this European diversity is also one of the recurring elements. Um, as our guide focuses on the social sciences, we have um, two types of tour guides uh, on qualitative and quantitative data, which basically give examples on data and how to deal with this uh, for qualitative and quantitative data which are two data types often used by the social sciences. And then the last recurring element is this adapt your data management plan or DMP. Um, and if you can go to the next slide. Yes, so a data management plan is a very important um, tool for researchers to organize um, your own research. And we wanted to help people to make a research data management plan uh, for their own uh, research. And we, so we created this checklist that people could follow when they follow the guide. And for each chapter, we have specific questions that um, you know, researchers can answer in order to create their own checklist for this guide and create their own data management plan, which they can then use, for instance, for funding or for other purposes um, in order to be able to, to talk about the research and document what they're doing. And the data management plan has uh, a lot of advantages. For instance, it can be a good tool to think ahead and it helps in project management. It can clarify the budget that is needed and it's also important to making data fair and showing accountability of what, um, what one's doing. And it's now often also required from funders, so we thought it would be good for us to help researchers create uh, such a DMP. So this is something that comes back after each chapter and um, researchers can follow this and make sure um, they create one for their own project. If you could go to the next slide. Because the data management expert guide was uh, designed for researchers as a self-study tool, but we also wanted um, to be a basis for training so that uh, trainers all across Europe and even globally could use the data management expert guide to help their researchers um, learn about research data management. So what we did in addition to the data management expert guide is that we developed a, a train the trainer package where we included um, not only for instance the images of the the guide as you can see below but also workshop outlines um, so ideas for workshops that you could give based on the information that we collected in the data management expert guide um, we have presentations there that can be reused, but also a lot of different exercises that can be used for training. So for instance, here I've um, put in a little screenshot from an exercise on re-identification re of qualitative data. So um, together with this presentations, exercises, and also documents such as the data management plan, but also handouts and evaluation forms and the images, we wanted to help the trainers um, that develop research data management training to use and reuse the materials that we had been creating. So this is a resource um, that we hope trainers can use um, to make sure that um, whoever they are training in their own country 
uh, can get the information from the data management expert guide. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, because the, the data management expert guide is really has to be also paced into a, a sort of broader context. So it was originally made for social scientists, but it's also very useful for other disciplines because data management is, is a very broad topic. And a lot of the, the, um, the issues that we face in the social sciences around, for instance, personal data and informed consent also play a role in other disciplines and also general concepts on how do I document my data? Where do I store my data? How do I publish my data? Where can I find data? Um, are not, of course, not limited to social sciences. So we think that our tool is very, very useful for other disciplines as well. And we want to make it um, available as widely as possible. So um, there are a couple of European projects now that are working on the European Open Science Cloud, which is a, an, um, a digital infrastructure that allows researchers and research professionals to find resources um, on, on research. And one of the things um, that they're also doing is um, developing a portal where people can find, for instance, training materials. And as of today, the data management expert guide is also part of this European Open Science Cloud portal. And um, the social sciences and humanities have their own project within the, uh, within the context of the EOSC or the European Open Science Cloud, which is called SHOCK. And uh, within this SHOCK project, they are also developing uh, training toolkits that help um, trainers find resources for their trainings. And also there, the data management expert guide um, is included. And I see somebody's raising their hand, but I think we'll just wait uh, with questions until a little bit later. So this is what I wanted to, to say about this aspect. If you could go to the next slide, yeah. So, uh, this was just a broad introduction to the data management expert guide and why we made it and for whom we made it and um, what i think is really nice today is that the two um, main uh, target audiences that we wanted to reach with this data management expert guide are here with us today as well so um, the dmac was mainly made for researchers to learn about data management so we have Sotrat Siang uh, here with us today who is going to talk about the researcher perspective and um, we also made it so that trainers can reuse the information and use um, the DMAC and everything we collected for training in their own institutions. So we have uh, Patricia Miranda from ICS uh, Lisboa here with us as well, who will talk about the trainer's perspective. So I hope that um, yeah, my short introduction and the researcher and trainer perspective today will give you a very complete picture of the data management expert guide. And um, I see, I can only see that there are quite some comments in the chat, so I okay, can have a look in a minute as well. Um, that was what I wanted to talk to you about today. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks for this very nice overview and very nice first introduction in the DMAG. Um, I, think, I think we can have one question now uh, so that we then take the rest uh, afterwards. So I, I saw that there was a hand raised by Mari Al 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 Almbro. So I don't know, Steph, if you can see that the question or if Mari could be unmuted for a second so she can ask the question. Sorry, can you just say the name again? I don't actually see the hand raised. Mari Albro, I saw. Oh, Mari, Mari said she just slipped on her keyboard. So ah, okay. She wanted to raise her hand. Okay, so then we take the rest of the questions uh, in the in, in the discussion later on. So now I would like to um, to give the floor to Patricia. Patricia, I'm going to shortly present you, and then uh, and then please uh, take us through the trainer's perspective. Uh, Patricia Miranda holds a PhD in sociology and a degree also in, soci in sociology, uh, the field of family and everyday life, both uh, by ISCTE IUL. She works as data manager in uh, Ap APIS Portuguese Archive of Social Information, uh, based in the ICSU Lisboa. Mm -hmm. She has a doctoral scholarship from the FCT for her project, Processes of, of Social Construction of Gender Identities in Children, a case study with a group of pre-adolescents in Viseu. Mm -hmm. 
merging at the intersection between sociology of the family, sociology of gender, and sociology of childhood. Sounds very interesting, Patricia. Yeah, Can you please you. take us through your, uh, your perspective uh, on the CESA GMAG? Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the opportunity for being here, uh, giving the trainer perspective. Yes, as you said, Mariek, I'm a sociologist and I'm working in APIS for almost two years. Now, uh, APIS is the Portuguese Archive of Social Information and it's a service provider uh, of CESDA. So that's why I'm here because uh, it, we should promote CESDA too. So if you can, um, yes, thank you. Uh, so in this slide, so I talk about the training workshops so that you organized last year uh, in November. We promote this tool, the Data Management Expert Guide, but also data management plan because they are linked yes so uh, and it's very important to to promote these tools among our designated community because they are not very much aware of these tools some most of the researchers were not aware of uh, of these tools actually uh, i forgot to say yes i don't know if pedro is online but pedro Ferreira is our coordinator in apish and so we organized this, this event. You can search here in the website. The, the, here you can, um, if you click on training workshop, you'll go to our website of APIG and you can uh, see there the presentations and the, the materials that we have used. Uh, actually, we had already participated in some train the trainer events. So you could use some materials provided in the training workshop uh, held in Aten. Um, so I must say that in that time in November last year, there was not yet any COVID, so we could uh, organize that workshop in person. Uh, we were able to do that, uh, fortunately, but this year we organized some online events already, uh, Zoom meetings, uh, also talking about data management plan and data management expert guide. Yes, that's very important to promote these tools among researchers. Because yes, they, they must be aware that data management is really uh, essential, an essential part of uh, a research best practice. Okay, if you can pass to the, the other slide, thank you. So yes, as um, Ricardo has already told us, um, she already talked about the train trainers package. So, and that's a, a, a really valuable tool for, for trainers. It contains several presentations, exercises, also images that I've, I've used. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very useful for trainers and for researchers also that can be, um, they can use uh, those materials. So why is Meg so important? Why is it so important? The Data Management Expert Guide uh, helps researchers not only to organize the data, their data and the research uh, data and metadata also, but uh, it helps helps researchers to develop their data management management plan, and uh, helps them also to to turn the, their data uh, findable, uh, accessible, findable, uh, interoperable, and reusable. So it helps. Uh, researchers to, um, to 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 make their research data fair. Yes, that's a more and more. Uh, um, I think that's very a very important thing nowadays. More and more, uh, we are hearing the importance of uh, of turning our research data fair. So and also very important that Ricardo already told uh, about that uh, that uh, research data life cycle because it. If the researchers are aware of the, the research data life cycle, they also, it's uh, easier for them to understand data management plan and data management expert guide. So they can be understood as crucial instruments by social science researchers. So in the next slide, you can see the, that the research data life cycle of CESDA. Here you can see publish and not archive and publish, but they are linked. Um, and I decided to talk a little bit uh, uh, of archive and publish, not only because I work in, uh, in an archive, but also because archive and publish is uh, very, very important to making your data fair. It's crucial that researchers know how to archive and publish the data in such a way that others can properly access, understand, use, and cite the data. So, and, this, and the, as you will see in the next slide, um, yes, because all, all phases are linked, of course, but in archive and publish, 
uh, I think it's very, very important because if you archive, uh, if the researchers archive their data in a proper way, uh, store the data in a suitable format and uh, with adequate documentation uh, and keep the data safe for the long term. So we are talking about the digital preservation and by documentation here, we mean all uh, files that direct or indirectly are related to the study and help to a better, a better comprehension so of the study, enable a, a full comprehension of the study. So, and in our website, also in APIS, you can see, and in every archive you have to, to you sh should, should have the, that information about how uh, or uh, um, the format, the preferable format for depositing the data. Um, and about publishing, yes, that's for high quality data with a potential, a potential for reuse. So, because if you publicly disclose your research data, you make uh, the data findable, accessible, at least the metadata, uh, interoperable and reusable. By interoperable, we mean that uh, it must contain basic machine actionable metadata. For example, uh, control vocabularies. I can give that example because CESDA uh, uses uh, control vocabularies. Uh, not only from CESA, but DDI uh, control vocabularies and the APISH had already participated in, the, in its translation, actually. Okay, thank you, Mariak, if you could. Okay, thank you. And um, for finishing my presentation, I would like to emphasize the, the importance of publishing in trust repositories, of course, and CESA archives. We actually, uh, PIS is, uh, is uh, submitting, uh, almost submitting uh, <laughs> the, the core trust field certification. We are preparing its certification, yes. Um, and uh, publishing with test archives increase the value of research data. So not only increase the, the visibility of the data, but its reuse and its citation. Um, so, and uh, Sotaran will talk about it, but I can uh, emphasize the importance of citing your data because of persistent e identifiers allow your data to be found and cited. Licensing your data uh, about the licenses is very important also to how applying a license to your data will determine its reusability. And finally, the access categories, uh, the deposits, when they deposit the data, the researchers deposit data in a piece, they have to choose the, the, the best license and because the, the, they have to, 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 to decide which data access uh, category is suitable for, for their data. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Patricia. It was a very nice introduction in, you, in the trainer's perspective. One of the uh, one of the, the target uh, audiences, as as Ricardo already mentioned, of the of the CESA DMAC. Um, okay, so now we quickly move on to the user's perspective presented today by. Uh, to us by Sotirat Seyang. So that I'm, I'm gonna briefly present you and then I'll, I'll pass the floor on to you. So Sotirat Seyang is a fourth year PhD candidate in economics at the Université Côte d'Azur in Nice, uh, and also one of the Eurodocs Open Science Ambassadors since 2019. He also participated in the CoData RDA uh, Data Stewardship Summer School in 2019 and is working with the regional unit of doctoral training uh, for an e-learning platform for research data. So Tirab, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marieke. Um, so as um, Marieke has briefly uh, explained, um, I am currently uh, doing my thesis in uh, economics. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Marieke? Yes, so um, just uh, briefly uh, what, my, what I do uh, uh, in my research. So for one chapter uh, where I have to, to collect um, data, so survey data and uh, those survey data, most uh, of the answers are uh, qualitative responses. Um, right now, what I produce are uh, figures, codes uh, and estimation results from uh, the data that I collected. I also use uh, complementary data, which uh, are uh, public data uh, that will be used for calibration uh, to correct for representativeness, etc. So this is just to show you briefly um, what kind of data I'm dealing with. And um, the, the fact that I have, um, 
I was aware uh, that uh, I had to uh, create a DMP uh, prior to conducting uh, my study, uh, thanks to my involvement with Eurodoc, etc., since uh, 2019, I was able to take some advance uh, in, in into the process. And so, being familiar with uh, open science, um, open data, and uh, the data management uh, knowledge that I have acquired, so I started to uh, make my own DMP. Uh, prior to the study. But uh, as you can see, uh, it's not always um, like easy. Um, although I had this uh, idea, I knew that I had to create a DMP, there were still some dark spots uh, to be filled. And so the context here is that I did not uh, read, that I did not uh, uh, hear about the DMEG prior to uh, creating my DMP or uh, doing uh, all my research process. And so those dark spots, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Very good. Uh, in those dark spots, so I actually uh, based my DMP um, on the DMP online template from the DCC, so the Digital uh, Creation Center from the University of Edin Edinburgh. So I was um, following uh, this uh, DMP template, which is uh, really good. Uh, you have um, a lot of uh, indications of advice uh, on uh, the steps uh, during your life, uh, data life cycle operation. But there were still uh, some problems, some unresolved issue. Um, once I had uh, finished my DMP, uh, especially in the part of uh, archiving and publishing. And so at the time, I had no idea about uh, the long-term preservation plan that uh, I, I had to do. So I, I, I left that uh, uh, um, spot blank uh, from my DMP. Um, another thing is that I didn't know actually how to assess the, the, the reuse potential of my data. Uh, at the time, I was just aware that I had to make it uh, available to other researchers without really considering uh, the extent, like uh, how, how reusable, how is the quality, is it even uh, reusable for others, or I just wanted to put the data there for reference. And so these are the points that uh, are addressed in the DMEG, -E -E sorry, and that uh, in which I find it really um, good and beneficial for other researchers. Also in the DMEG, um, you have uh, this sort of comparison between the pros and the cons of uh, different uh, data publishing routes, which I find um, really useful because uh, when you arrive at this step of uh, archiving and publishing, you have many solutions uh, uh, to, to choose from. And so by having this sort of quick analysis of the, of the pros and the cons, it, it would have helped me a lot, actually, and not just uh, arriving at this step, but even before arriving at this step. So how, how, could, how should I tailor my database in order to, to get uh, published or uh, archived in this or that uh, repository, for example. And also, uh, the, 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 the next thing that I learned and I didn't know is that you have some repositories that actually can promote your data. And this is also another a uh, very, um, I think, relevant uh, point uh, that was brought uh, by the DMEG. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but, but besides that, uh, for, for researchers, at least uh, in, in my perspective and in my case, uh, in my laboratory, uh, we don't have that culture of um, data management. And so in general, it's not just data management, but open science uh, is not something that my fellow researchers are aware about or are interested in because um, they, they don't think it's uh, very useful. And I think uh, maybe it's also valid in other research laboratories, but uh, in my laboratory, um, one of the hurdles is that uh, you listen and you follow what your supervisor tell you and you sort of uh, um, act um, accordingly to him. And so all the directives or all, all the initiatives must come from above 
And so if, for example, the director of uh, the laboratory uh, organized a webinar or a seminar to show you the importance of data management, how it can benefit not just uh, you, but uh, uh, the whole community, how, uh, how it could have helped you uh, before uh, uh, engaging in the research process, how it would have saved you a lot of time, I believe that 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 will be uh, listened by uh, the young uh, P the young researchers or the PhD candidates, rather than um, directly uh, approaching them by, for example, me, uh, uh, who is a, a one of Eurodoc Open uh, Science Ambassadors. Like I feel like uh, they they it, it would it wouldn't be really effective if it comes from a fellow researcher rather than someone. Um, above them uh, in, in a hierarchical sense. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. And I think, yeah, I think uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sotira. That was very interesting. And I think, Ricardo, you will come back also to, to the comments made by, by Sotira for, for possibly future, future activities. Um, but for now, I would really like to, uh, to pose you a few questions that I think uh, would have been would be very interesting to learn from each of your your perspectives. Um, uh, so, what is the importance of a data management plan? Um, so, I think it would be nice, uh, Ricardo. Could you could you take this first question and then and then we 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 have the the other perspectives. Yes, of course. Um, so, I think data management plan and research data management are really very much linked, right? So the idea of a data management plan is that it would summarize all of the things um, surrounding your study. So um, everything you need to know. And I think it is important in sort of two, two ways. So I think one is that um, it makes it easier for you to have an overview of a given study, which makes it easier for others to understand what, what somebody is doing. Um, so, and this is also, for instance, why um, it is now required by funding organizations or by, uh, by, by archives to, to encourage people to have a data management plan, because it, it, it helps people to understand what, what has been hap happening to a particular data set. But I think it's also important for the researcher, him or herself, because it can help you to, um, in the beginning, maybe also clarify a couple of questions you might have. How am I going to collect my data? What will I do with this? But it will also help you to, um, for instance, look back uh, the information. So you have all the information about your study in one place. And if somebody asks you uh, some specific information at a later time point, then you're able to go to this one document. So I think it can really be a, a place of information um, that is relevant for, for yourself as a researcher, but also for others that want to make use of your data. And I think um, how we see it in the, in the DMAC is that it's kind of a summary of all of the different things in the life cycle that you should consider. Um, all of the questions you have around planning, data curation, um, data documentation, also archiving and publishing, you would summarize that in a data management plan. So that is, that is sort of my perspective. Thanks, Ricardo. So that's, you, 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 you mentioned that it helps other people to understand where the data comes from and what, what has happened with them. And you also point out that it, it can help you as a researcher to clarify your own questions. And I think we've, we've also seen that with Sotia Rat uh, already in, in his presentation. Patricia, can, can, do you recognize this in your, in your uh, community when you have to train researchers? Yes. Uh, so yes, uh, actually I'm regarding my, our research community, especially in ECS, because APIG is based on uh, Institute of Social Sciences in University of Lisbon. And uh, uh, I think they are not uh, much aware, and even in ISTE that it's nearby, or even in uh, other universities in uh, in the country. Maybe in the north there there are little communities that uh, already use the uh, data management plan, but uh, very few. Yes, actually, I think it's very few, and that's uh, that's a big challenge for uh, for the archives, uh, up in Lisbon and others in the north um, of Portugal. That we must promote. Uh, the tool, uh, even in uh, last week, we had a forum that it was uh, called Forum of Research Data Management, uh, da data management yes, in research data uh, management. It's very important to, to promote these tools. Um, not only, yes, we promote the SESTA tools, of course, but as Sotaran has told, there are uh, different uh, data management plans templates. 
and uh, and some some researchers are aware of uh, of data digital curation center yes i suppose uh, but uh, in apis we 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 want to promote uh, most of all the test the tools so we we are giving some workshops on the on these tools and uh, showing the importance of organizing their their data showing the researchers the importance of organizing their data from the beginning uh, being aware that the data management plan is a living document as you said in the in the quiz there was a question about this it's actually it's a, a living document it's not a static document and therefore it will need to be revised uh, along with the development of the research uh, projects um, but it's very important that researchers uh, uh, are willing to to organize the data the metadata uh, knowing, uh, being aware of control vocabularies, for example, this for much much important for 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 uh, the interoperable, for example, the the eye of fair, <laughs> uh, but also the persistent identifier that uh, already they already use, for example, in articles, uh, much the most part of of um, uh, articles have a DOI. So there's a persistent identifier, but uh, researchers are not very much aware of uh, of this importance of, of uh, the data being fair, for example, because actually data management plan um, promotes promotes not only the, the reusability of their data, but yes, it's uh, it's making their data more compliant with fair principles, and it's very important to show the researchers. Uh, how it's uh, it's it's happening? Yes, that way. I I have here a, a sentence I can tell you. I think it's um, it gives a, a good idea. Uh, good research data management. It's not a goal in itself, but rather the key conduit leading leading to knowledge discovery and innovation, and so and to subsequent data and knowledge integration and reuse. So I think it's very important. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Patricia. So you, you're talking about good research data management that it will support also knowledge discovery. Uh, so Tiara, do you want to comment on this question? Yes, I, I will make it very short. Um, uh, I know there are a lot of benefits as mentioned by our uh, previous uh, speakers, but I will just point out two main reasons, at least for me. Uh, first one is very simple. It's a time saving uh, efficiency for the researcher. Um, once you understand uh, what the DMP is used for, you not only improve uh, the, uh, the, the wealth uh, being of uh, the whole community, but you as a researcher, you manage to do the research more efficiently also. You can manage uh, better uh, how you name the files, for example, how you organize the data, how you, how you keep control of the versions, etc. And the second reason is just uh, for credibility. I have a lot of fellow colleagues uh, that have uh, papers published, but when you ask them, uh, wh what about the data? Uh, which data did you use? Can I, uh, can uh, we, we, we have, we can we check the data? Can we reuse? For them, it's just um, not, not possible. It, it's not in the equation. And so for me, it's just uh, this uh, for, for two main reasons. So time saving and credibility. That's a very nice uh, and very powerful answer, uh, such as that. So time saving and credibility, thanks. Um, so then let's go to the next question. How does the DMAC, how does the CESA DMAC help researchers? Um, maybe Patricia, you can take this one first. Yes, thank you, Mariek. So yes, as I was saying, and uh, me and Ricardo already talked about the, the research that data life cycle. So I think it's very important to, and if they go along the, the set the website to see the different chapters, uh, I think it helps researchers mainly figuring out the different phases and showing them how the different phases are all interconnected um, and understanding the, the main questions in each phase because they can really search in each phase um the different questions and the, at the end of each chapter each chapter uh, there is a section that it's adapt your uh, data management plan and they can see the different elements and specific questions that, uh, that maybe i think it helps a lot researchers actually to organize their data and uh, there are a lot of questions there so maybe there are it's too extensive but i think if they search, they do a, they do a, they do a good search uh, in the website. There's all, all there are all the questions that they need 
to to do a, a good uh, guide. Uh, there's a, a good it's a good guide, and it uh, uh, it helps them a lot to do a, a, do a good uh, data management plan. Yes, uh, I already gave gave some advice to some researchers in the institute. Um, because sometimes they get lost in so in a lot. Uh, there's a lot of information actually, but I think yes, if they would, uh, would they do a good search, uh, it uh, it helps a lot to to structuring and organizing their data in their research projects. Yes. Thanks, Patricia. So you you highlight the fact that it helps them structure and organize their data, uh, and you also really complement uh, the adapt your own data management plan uh, uh, topic in the in the in the guide. Uh, Ricarda, do you want to mention anything else? Do you want to add to this? Yeah, I think I think um, a lot of the things have been mentioned already, but I, I also think what Sudirat mentioned just now in the for the first question is that it also I think saves time in the end because and it allows you actually to make your research available to others because if somebody comes to you and asks you about your data but you have not done anything with data management you will probably not be able to help them with it even though if you would want to it would cost you a lot of time whereas if you um if you follow the the data management expert guide and you you think about these different things before starting your research i think it can save you time uh, in then preparing your data, sharing it with others. And I think that is that, that is something that um, researchers need to do more, but also sometimes want to do more because you want to help your colleagues if they ask you for, for information. And then it's very frustrating if you cannot find it back. So I think the, the proper data management and the, the DMAC as a tool helps people to avoid this sort of frustration at a later stage. Thanks, Ricardo. I find that very interesting because you and I know that you've done extensive research because of, uh, from all the different sources and that you, you've kind of come to the DMAC as, a, as, a, as an overview. So this will help researchers not to have to do their own uh, finding their way, but it, it, it gives them very direct pointers to where they have to look, what they have to use. So that's, I think that's a very interesting point. So Sotirat, do you want to, to add anything to how does the DMAC help researchers? How, how would it help you? Yes, um, so beyond the uh, methodological aspects, uh, technical aspects um, that the DMG provide, um, you have also this, um, I, I find it very rich and relevant, uh, the philosophy behind um, each step, like uh, why would you do that? Um, what's, what's the incentive behind? And so in general, if I had to just uh, answer in, a, in just one sentence, so how does the DMG help researchers? Well, it helps the researchers become greater researchers. Like you can, you can be a good researcher, but you can become a great researcher if you understand, for example, the ethics behind uh, the, the data that you're dealing with, uh, the consent that you, that you need to, to, to verify beforehand. And so in, in general, um, I, I think reading this document, uh, it, it can only um, make you a, a greater researcher because you understand more about the data, you understand more how to uh, manage and how to um, um, collaborate uh, in a, in in a, with with other researchers. So yeah. Thanks, Sotirat. I'm going to move quickly to the next question because I'm I'm now pressed for time and I find all your opinions very very relevant for all these questions. So what would you have done differently knowing about the DMAC at the start of your research? And I think actually, so that this this is one more uh, more of a question to you. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, I have uh, built, created my DMP uh, prior to uh, uh, knowing the DMEG and even already conducted my research, uh, done the analysis, etc. If uh, I had known about the DMG uh, before uh, doing all of this, uh, I would have um, changed the way uh, I conducted, uh, I, I created my questionnaire for the survey, because you remember my data is uh, our survey response. So if I had a clearer vision on how to uh, archive uh, uh, the, the potential reusability of uh, my data, it, it, it wouldn't cost me anything to add just, for example, a few questions, like even if it's not in the, in the, in the scope of my research, but if I, 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 I had a, a, a vision that, okay, since I am doing the survey already, it wouldn't cost me much to just put in, for example, this is, this is just an example, some, uh, a few more questions so that 
when I when I will um, get the data, uh, other researchers, if they are also interested in the same topic but may have like a, a slightly different perspective, what I what uh, what I ask the respondents, they can reuse that. Okay, so that's just like one 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 angle uh, uh, to look at it. And if I had read that before, it, it would have uh, saved me even like more time than than right now because as I as I said, there are some dark spots in my in my DMP that I uh, did not manage to completely answer. And so this document, since it's very rich um, with a lot of um, complementary information, advice, and even external links to, to understand more about each step of the data management. Uh, in, 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 in overall, I think um, it would have helped me um, in just time saving and shaping even better my uh, research process. Thank you, Sotirat. So I, I find it very interesting that we come back to the, the aspect that Ricardo already mentioned earlier as well, that it saves you time. So that's 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 a very interesting point, um, Stephanie. Is there any question from the audience that we need to answer before we we jump into the the into the next uh, question? No, no, there aren't, Marie. But we've got some okay. very interesting comments, and thank you for sharing all the links and everything. Okay, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Um, so, Ricardo, Patricia, do you want to mention like one phrase on on this uh, on this topic, or uh, in addition to what Sotirat already mentioned in terms of time saving? Maybe something from your own students, uh, Patricia? I don't think so. I think uh, um, every phase is important, as I was saying before, but maybe in protection, I think I, I see here the, there's a little discussion about uh, um, how to turn that affair and the, the issues of ethical, this is very important issues of, of protecting the data. Uh, and um, so yes, it's a, it's an important phase, of course. Um, and uh, actually in one uh, research, I, I gave advice to, to one researcher that was dealing with some uh, sensitive data like political orientation, uh, and so, yes, and it's, they have to be aware, one of the things that uh, researchers must be aware is how to protect the data uh, and when archiving the data, how can they do that? And I, I, I can help them, of course, as a data manager to curate the data and to publish the data uh, in, in, the, in the respective terms, yes, in the correct terms, uh, protecting the, that specific data, yes. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, okay, I've seen that we've we've uh, come to the end. Uh, Ricarda, what I wanted to ask you, uh, coming back to the earlier comment of Soterat about the awareness uh, of uh, tools such as the CESA DMAC, how, uh, do you want to comment on that? How do you see that in terms of the uh, the, the experts in, in CESA, the expert uh, training uh, group, uh, what could we do uh, to, to, to foster the, the use both from bottom up as top down? Uh, do, do you have any opinions or any key takeaways that we can, that we can say uh, that we can close the, the webinar uh, with? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good question and a very, a bit of a challenge, I would say. So I think what is already nice is that we sort of combined forces in this. So instead of um, having every archive have their own uh, tool or resource, we decided from SESTA, we want to have it in one. And some of the local archives are now also translating resources in their own languages. So we hope that um, we sort of made a nice tool that others can also reuse. But I also realized that, uh, yeah, it's difficult sometimes to reach the people you want to reach. For instance, I'm really happy that Soterat in the end uh, found the DMAC, but um, you can see also that often the researchers that find this information are the ones that are interested in open science and very engaged already. And of course, we want to also find the, the ones that are, that are not. And I think it is, um, it is a bit of a change in culture that is happening that will continue to happen. So I think I'm, I'm very hopeful there. Um, I would hope that everybody uh, who was here today uh, has a look at the DMAC and if you think it's useful then tell your colleagues about it and um, um, yeah so we are, we're hoping through these webinars and other sort of outreach activities that uh, more people know about it and I think it always takes a little bit of time for it to really gain traction 
Um, we are also planning next year uh, uh, local events for SESTA at uh, different service providers who will reuse the materials and we're expanding it. So I think there's still a lot of ongoing work that we're doing and having um, these, these webinars and the, the information available, I think is the sort of the first step. But I'm also really curious if people have ideas on how we can promote it in different uh, communities, if people here know uh, uh, what could help us to make sure more people really use it and find it, I think that would be really nice. But, so that's a question to the audience, I, I understand, it Ricardo. Is a little bit, yeah. yeah. So maybe if someone wants to, to, to answer this question from the audience or, or put it in the chat, that would be really, really nice to, to, to learn. Uh, then uh, while you are doing that, I'm, I'm going to close the, the webinar. Uh, we are, uh, it's, it's already one minute past three and, and I know everybody has a very full agenda. So I just wanted to uh, thank Ricarda, Patricia and Sotia for, uh, for their very interesting insights and their discussion and willingness to, to, to engage all of us uh, in uh, a little bit in, in what you're doing, your daily jobs, but also uh, in, in promoting the CESA GMAC uh, for its wider use. Um, so uh, also for all the people that have uh, supported uh, this webinar, there were many people uh, behind the scenes that you haven't seen today, but thanks to all of them. Uh, and it rests me to say that uh, the slides and the recordings will be made available via SESDA channels. Uh, and you will, uh, in the next day or so, you will receive uh, a mail with the, with, uh, the link to recordings and, and slides uh, that you can uh, revisit and, uh, and, and reuse, of course. Um, so also thank you to all of you who have been joining this webinar. Um, and with this, I wish you a very, very nice day. So thank you. And thank you, Marike, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.